Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we come again on this new week, as we open the word of the Lord, shall we ask for his guidance and for his blessing so that we may more truly understand that which is before us and that which he would have us understand for this time in this earth's history. Shall we pray? <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to assemble together, to open your word, to eat of your flesh and drink of your blood. Help us now that we may become strong, that we may understand that which you have presented before us. Direct us now, Father. Help us by sending your spirit. May your angels also attend us so that we may breathe the atmosphere of heaven as we study. That our thoughts may be lifted up. That we may be guided into the path that you would have us to follow at this time. I thank you for those that have come to attend this meeting and those that will attend this later via the internet. We need you each one. Help us so that this body may become unified. Help us so that we may become a people ready to give the message that you would have this world given. Direct us to this end. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. There are a few points that I think we need to recover from Numbers 23. Now, as we looked at this at the beginning of the week, going through this from 23 verses 1 to 4, Balaam tells Balak to build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. Mrs. White writes that Balaam had some knowledge of the sacrificial offerings of the Hebrews. And he thought that by surpassing them in costly gifts, he might secure the divine blessing and ensure the accomplishment of his sinful projects. Now, ultimately, what is Balaam trying to do? Is he not trying in his own mind to convince God that he should change his mind? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, as we know from Scripture, God is not a man. He is not fickle. He does not change his mind because of great offerings that are put before him. Yeah, he's, he's treating God as if he's a pagan God, which, of course... He was a believer of the true God, so he should know God's character and that that's not possible. Okay. Now, how is this different from what happened with the General Conference in 1888? Um, how is this different? Yeah. Um. Well, you need to explain because okay we are all familiar with the events of the general conference me meeting in minneapolis minnesota in 1888 correct yeah so in 1888 you have this debate going on within within adventism you have uh jones and wagner who have been teaching that uh when Christ took upon himself human nature, 
that this is when he was made under the law and that the term under the law does not ref the law there does not refer to the ceremonial law but to the moral law that is he was under the condemnation of the moral law and that's something that uh, G.I. Butler and others could not accept. So that was the the main issue at 1888. And, and that's because they had been using this argument in their debates with others. That is, they, um, they would argue that when it says we're not under the law, that this is just referring to the ceremonial law. And so they felt that Jones and Wagner's had, had taken away one of their arguments that they had used to defend themselves against those that were opposing the Sabbath. So I'm not sure how that would parallel unless there's, I mean, uh, I mean, I don't see that there's, that people are trying to, it, in, in a large way, win God's favor, unless you're trying to say that somehow with their lack of understanding of righteousness by faith, they were legalists. That's what I'm saying. <clears throat> at the meeting in Minneapolis uh -huh. we are aware from the writings of Sister White that there were only three people that understood the message that was being given Yeah, and I would have to say that those three people were Ellen White Elliot Wagner and A.T. Alon Jones. Yeah, so Alonzo Jones. Right. Alonzo Trevier Jones. Yeah. Now, that means that Mrs. White's son didn't understand this. No. Nope. That means that G.I. Butler did not understand it. It means that Uriah Smith did not understand it. It means that the other attendees did not understand it. Yeah, which, you know, is kind of interesting in that because people would look at, I mean, the church would look at this and say, well, they did understand it, and it was accepted by the church. Um, so they really deny what Ellen White says. But, okay, in this situation, was Balaam right? in his thought that if he gave more costly gifts that God would change his mind. No. no. Has the church been right in the thought that they've understood the message of righteousness by faith since 1888? No, no they're wrong. Yeah. Now, with this session that occurred, after the session, you had a time period where meetings were done throughout the country mm -hmm. by Mrs. White, A.T. Jones, and Elliot Wagner. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing that stood out to me as I've studied this history. Great offerings poured in unbidden. Mm -hmm. The church itself began to fear that they were losing control of the membership because these monies were coming in without Mrs. White or any of the others with her saying anything about money the message affected the heart so much that the people that were hearing the message recognized that they had not been being honest that more needed to be done for this message to go out and the church was afraid that if they lost control of the money they would lose control of everything else going on. Mm -hmm. They were more afraid that they would not be able to secure the divine blessing by controlling the people and controlling the money. Mm 
slide, I have to comment that people that are more interested in control and money, they don't really care what God thinks of them. I mean, God is very far from their thoughts. They've set themselves up as God. Isn't that the point? Mm -hmm. So thus the sentiments of the idolatrous Moabites were gaining control of Balaam's mind. In 1888, idolatry had already begun to permeate through the leadership. And so this is a lot about control of Adventism. It was about the money, their position, their status. Right. Much like Balaam. Exactly. Now, we also know that Balaam parallels America. Agreed. And um, so there must be some parallel there. Well, in the same, in the same vein, this final sentence runs directly in that, in the example that we're addressing. Surely his wisdom had become foolishness. His spiritual vision was beclouded. He had brought blindness upon himself by yielding to the power of Satan. So one of the things about the, the first generation, so 1888 marks the end of the first generation. And, and we know that the church had, had um, uh, been Laodicean, well, at least since 1850, that 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 that's James Wood's first statement, though he is to a large degree referring to First Day Adventists as well. Um, but really, that first generation becomes complete in its blindness. It's and and you can see that the message that that is rejected is the very message of the Laodicean message, because the message of righteousness by faith is the message to the Laodiceans. Right. So in 1888, they reject that remedy. And then we now are going to go through, um, if we're going to look at the parallel to that and the four seven times, because there's the four generations, the four seven times, it's the same thing. We see that um, the first generation ends in, in the four seven times, ends with... Um, Daniel's captivity, which is preceded two years prior with uh, the death of Josiah, the failed reform. So that's what we have here in 1888, a message given, but a failed reform. And then because of that, the church progresses through the second, third and fourth generation until a reform line appears. Now, which is what in, in, with a, ancient Israel. From what we've been covering in Numbers, how many times does Balaam instruct Balak to erect seven altars? Uh, well, there was, there's, uh, okay, that's a good question, because uh, if you just go on the scripture itself, it mentions it twice, but Ellen White says that it occurs each time. I would say three, wouldn't it? Three times. I believe that there are four. Well, there's four. Now, and and so, I mean, this is a little bit ahead, but when you get to uh, the fourth, the final oracle, and that's what I was uncertain about, whether uh, Ellen White is clear that it says each of the four times, uh, because the final oracle, when I look at it, it just – so I'm just reading it here from Numbers 24. Um, it's it, it appears as if he just states the final oracle without all the preparatory things. They're not going to move to some new location or anything like that. But, but I'm not certain. And uh, I was, wasn't certain if Ellen White is referring to all four times or to the first three. Because the fourth seems kind of different, but but I could be wrong. Um, I'm not wrong. I just not, not certain, I guess. Okay. 
because what does she say? Um, I'm just going to find this here in Patriarchs and Prophets. So she says, um, uh, so she says, um, regarding the first one, you know, the seven altars were erected. And then she says in um, the second one, the seven altars were erected. Um, um, I can't, where is it here? I don't know, maybe you have, have it. Um, yeah, so, because it's in, in here, so they're going to have the third one. Um, as he listened to the prophet's words, Balak was overwhelmed with disappointed hope. This is page, uh, the last paragraph of page 450, Patriarchs and Prophets. With fear and rage, he was indignant that Balaam could have given him the least encouragement of a favorable response. When everything was determined against him, he regarded with scorn the prophet's comp comp compromising deceptive course. The king exclaimed fiercely, therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. The answer was that the king had been forewarned that Balaam could speak only the message given him from God. Before returning to his people, Balaam uttered a most beautiful and sublime prophecy of the world's Redeemer and the final destruction of the enemies of God. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not not. He will become a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. So this is going to be... Um, it appears like the third time that he's brought to a place that he's going to then utter two prophecies. Um, it says in the third time here, he, the same number of altars were erected as before and the same number of sacrifices were offered as at other times. So the third time we know that he's going to do the seven altars with the seven bullocks, the seven rams. But when it comes to the fourth one, it appears that it's just a fourth prophecy he utters without any preparation. It occurs at the same spot that the third uh, uh, oracle or prophecy is uttered. Okay, then I would be correct. Thank you. Okay. So, so what this would be is this three-one combination. All right. Um, and, and so there must be something to this, um, why it is this way. Well, it's also, isn't it also interesting that before they come to attempt to curse Israel, Balaam is brought into the city of streets to a banquet basically a celebration in honor of the pagan gods mm -hmm. so there are sacrifices there is food that has been offered to idols and balaam partakes of all this because he is seeking to receive the great honor that Balak has promised. Yeah. In a similar way, Balak is offering to Balaam that if you will study in my methods, that we can become unified. much as the church had accepted the Protestant methods of study rather than line upon line and rather than using Miller's rules. <clears throat> so 
in this situation. Balak's, or excuse me, Balaam's wisdom had become foolishness. His wisdom as a man became foolishness. His spiritual vision, his vision of what God would have him to understand was beclouded. Now, when it says that it has become beclouded, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to anybody? Well, a cloud goes in front of your your spiritual vision. Okay. As we've as we've talked in past studies and, and at past times, you start to I I've had to start to understand that when your vision is beclouded, it's very much like having what the doctors would call a cataract. Mm -hmm. you're able to see shapes but nothing is clear nothing comes into into focus nothing is understandable because your vision winds up with a an obstruction now because of this it is said that Balaam brought blindness upon himself. How did he bring that blindness upon himself, according to what Mrs. White has written? By rejecting the knowledge of God. Well, again, as she said, he had brought blindness upon himself by yielding to the power of Satan. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the comments from the chat, could this city of streets, the way there are horizontal, would, would you mean to say horizontal and horizontal lines or horizontal and vertical lines? What, what are you saying? I'm, I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at the chat right now. Oh, oh. Did I screw that up too? I'm, I'm asking, I'm just asking the yeah, question my, because horizontal, yeah, horizontal and vertical is definitely what I meant, but did I put? <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm, I'm going to read, I, I'm trying to read your mind as I read this, this from the chat. <laughs> Don't try. I, oh yeah. I see what I, yeah. I meant vertical. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> Could this city of streets, the way there are horizontal and vertical lines represent the lines and way marks the banquet, the feasting of the word, the idolatry, a counterfeit of worshiping God, which is the point that I was trying to make. Very nicely put. Really? <laughs> so in this situation, Balaam is showing his foolishness and he's showing that he really does not have clear spiritual vision because he's chosen to yield to the power of the adversary. Isn't this just like what happened in 1888? And this is, a, it's a hard comment to have to make, but it's, it, it's just something that to me is very clear. Balaam ordered seven altars to be erected, and with a zeal worthy of a better cause, he offered upon each altar an ox and a ram. He then withdrew to an high place to meet with God, promising to make known to Balak whatever the Lord should reveal. Balaam had been greatly terrified by his encounter with the angel on the journey to Moab. But he now flattered himself that by his offerings, the divine anger would be appeased. And his first words on entering the presence of God were an enumeration of these sacrifices on Baal's heights. But they had been offered without repentance, faith, 
obedience, or love, and by hearts that were filled with enmity to God. Now, if we take these four words, repentance, faith, obedience, love, can we then show steps through the sanctuary? First angel's message. Is that not a message of repentance? Mm -hmm. Amen. Second angel's message. Is that not a message of obedience? Third angel's message. Is this not a message of faith? Are they all not offered in love? I know Ellen White often would say, faith which worketh by love and purifies the soul. Like she often would combine those two verses. And yeah, you can see it as you go through the three angels' messages. Balaam showed none of these in seeking to give this sacrifice. He was refusing the steps that are necessary in order to come into a covenantal relationship with God. If we are unwilling to fear God, then we're not repenting of our sins. If we are unwilling to give glory to him, how could we obey him? If we come to the hour of his judgment, can we appear before him in our own robe of righteousness? Or does it take faith to accept the robe of Christ's righteousness? <clears throat> we have to make these decisions as these are presented before us. Hmm. He who is perfect in wisdom and holiness cannot accept the fruit of hypocrisy, of covetousness, and of malice. Balaam was coveting the great reward. He was telling Balak that I'm going to go off, I'm going to seek God's word, but he wanted God to agree so that Balaam would have great gain. Now, none of this was done in the past out of any malice within the church or within the movement. But there have been times that we have sought a blessing that was not according to God's design. And we had to learn lessons, right? The same spirit which actuated Balaam exists in the hearts of men today. How many claim to be Christians while they are as destitute of true godliness as was the presumptuous prophet? They scorn the idea of repentance toward God because they have transgressed his law. They claim Christ as their savior while their actions show that they have not his spirit. They are at war with the sacred law of God and seek to hide their wicked defection under the grace and mercy of Christ. 
whose mission to earth was to vindicate the claims of his father's law. I have, he asserts, kept my father's commandments. Now we jump through this. As she states, that law flashes conviction on every side. Sinners desire to be freed from it, and many who call themselves Christian clothe their sinful, hypocritical souls in the garments of Christ's righteousness and trample under their feet God's great rule of right. The worship offered to God by this class is similar to Balaam's offering on behalf of Balak. They are equally offensive to God. Do we want to be found in this class? Do we want it said of us that we are no better than Balaam? Numbers 23, 5. <clears throat> and the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. Notwithstanding the sinfulness of Balaam's course, the Lord saw fit to convey through him a message to the king of Moab. And the words uttered were not for him alone, but were, for, were to be traced on the pages of history as an admonition and encouragement to Israel in all ages. So who are the words of Balaam for? Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to the church of all times, but he's also giving the Moabites a chance to hear God's word. The Moabites have passed from the scene right now. Okay, the king of Moab, who would convey that to his people, supposedly. Hopefully. Okay, but my, I guess my overarching point in taking Mrs. White as at her word, that this prophecy as it is given, this parable as it is given, is an admonition and encouragement to us the Israel of today. Right. The impatient king with the nobles and princes of Moab stood beside the smoking sacrifice while around them gathered expectant multitudes eagerly watching for the return of the prophet. He came at last and the people waited breathlessly for the words that would paralyze forever that mysterious power working in favor of the hated Israelites. In the solemn silence, they listened for him to utter the curse. He spoke. And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? We can apply this to what is going to occur with the Sunday law. We are aware, we are very specifically aware that the Sunday law will go on in darkness. We're not going to know as it is being put together. Just as much as Israel did not know that which was occurring with Balak and Balaam. Throughout this, God's people 
God's true hearted people will rest in his assurance. From the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. Balaam confessed that he came with the purpose of cursing Israel and strengthening the hearts of the people of Moab. In this, we could make the application that Balaam represents the United States, but that would then mean that the people of Moab represent the rest of the world. We could also make the application that spiritually, Balaam represents the corporate church, and then the people of Moab represent the United States. But the power of the Lord rested upon him and controlled his speech. The words he uttered were directly contrary to the sentiments of his heart. In the most solemn prophecy, he pronounced blessings upon Israel, while his soul was filled with curses. The verse, verses prior said that he took up his parable. So this parable is also a prophecy. God had given Balaam an evidence of divine power in speaking through the dumb ass, the dumb beast. And this wicked man was now an instrument in the hand of God as verily as the beast had been. He had no more power to control his words and no more reason to take glory to himself than had the animal upon which he rode. What other symbols are we delving and deriving from all of this as being presented? This is a very deep passage. I don't think we've even really begun to scratch the surface. Balaam was shown the, pecu the peculiar favor with which God regarded Israel and their distinctive character as his chosen people. He saw that the position to be maintained by the Israelites, a complete separation from all surrounding nations, represented the relation which all true Christians should sustain the world. Can we say truthfully that we have had a complete separation from all of those around us? Are we showing ourselves to be God's peculiar people or are we choosing as have many within the movement? to join with the rest of the world and prophesy that which the world is believing is going to happen. That's not a difficult question, but it's one that has to be faced. Yeah, so, you know, the, the problem that people have is they can think that they're not like the world because there are certain things that they do that are unlike the world. But yet, part of what I see, the, you know, I'm not good at judging people's motives, but we can see that some people have expressed as we've moved through July 18th and its failed prediction, some people have expressed that 
basically they were embarrassed. Right? Agreed. Now, of course, they they said this in the context of that they were trying to witness to people and now they're embarrassed. And how are they going to be have any influence with anybody anymore if they continue to believe July 18th? I mean, that that's what I heard plainly stated by quite a few. And and of course, probably the tip of the iceberg that many other felt many others felt the same way. And, and with the Trump prediction, I see basically the same idea that it's and in that you know we weren't wrong because some people took the position quite strongly uh, with people they knew that Trump's going to be the last president what was going to happen with the election that Trump was going to win and that he didn't win and then uh, and, and to me this so much parallels those who were were Trump supporters who believed that Trump was going to win and kept saying that you know the election was going to be overturned so we had all of this happening where when i looked at it um based upon the lines and the information that we had once we came to january 6th it became quite clear um with all of the symbols that were there and and even with uh, the death of um ashley elizabeth babbitt and and all the symbols that were tied to her and her name and etc so we had all of these symbols showing that that was the that was uh the event that marked the end of the united states in our symbolic line literally is it the end of the united states we could say the same with august 11th 1840. august 11th 1840 is that the end of the ottoman empire it was the end of the sovereignty of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, but it's it's hardly even recognized anymore. Right. right. I mean, they will look at when the Turkish Sultan, whatever, in 1922 on November 1st, when the Sultan had ended. Right. So so they would say from from a worldly perspective, uh, Turkey didn't end on August 11th, 1840. And, and they will have all kinds of arguments. Well, you know, even though that that happened and they yielded to the to the to the four Christian nations, all this rebellion happened, all these different wars, you know, it's it wasn't a significant event in their minds. But yet we know what the symbol is prophetically, that that event matched the prediction, not the prediction particularly of Josiah Litch, because he actually, once he realized that the Ottoman Empire hadn't actually fallen and that things hadn't gone the way that he expected to proceed to progress, 11th, 1840, he eventually rejects his own prophecy because his expectations were actually different. But Ellen White, when the way she words it in The Great Controversy, she you can see that she's not saying it's the fall of the Ottoman Empire occurred on August 11th, 1840, that the, that the end of the second woe occurred on August 11th, 1840. But the prediction there is the prediction of Scripture not necessarily the prediction of Lich. He provides the date, but he doesn't fully understand the event. And this is the problem here with this movement. Either January 6th is the correct date, right, because it fits into the structure for the end of the United States, or it's not. Trump is the last president of the United States. If you have to make him president again, then you reject the idea that he was the last president of the United States on January 6th. Right. So isn't this the same as the Manasseh issue? Uh, so with Manasseh's captivity? Yeah, you know, Manasseh, when he went in, that was that was the, uh, the checkoff time um, for the start or the end of a certain prophecy. Yeah, and, the, the, yeah, the first seven times, and and the question is, as you're saying, is the question is, well, Israel didn't go into captivity according to those who criticize the 2520, right? That's not going to happen until 70 years later, right? 
Right. But we know that Manasseh's captivity is not predicting the captivity of Israel. It's it's the it's a fulfillment of a certain prophecy. Yeah, the prediction. Well, the yeah. Well, one is it predicts from Isaiah chapter seven, right? Talking about the second king that would be uh, taken captive. Israel shall be forsaken of both her kings. So the first one in in seven twenty three, the second in six seventy seven. But also mm -hmm. it's 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 the first seven times the breaking of the pride of power. So again, my question is is doesn't this um, that um, issue uh, kind of parallel this issue that we're having right now that we're talking about, about the president? Right. The problem is not understanding prophecy correctly. How, yes. we, how you look at an event prophetically compared to how the world looks at an event. I mean, we, we have the same thing with the 1260 years. Yes. Right. So people, or, or even things like the fall of the Roman Empire, how do you determine, or the fall of paganism, uh, how do you determine that prophetically compared to how the world would look at it? Right. And this is the problem, is that we're looking at things like the world looks at it and figures that figure that the prophecy has to be fulfilled like the world would see it. But this, for one, is our line is typical. So we know that the United States did not fall on January 6th, 2021, but it did fall in our line. And, and we know that that's typical of something that will happen. Um, and, and this is all in connection with the, you know, the midnight, the midnight cry and the Sunday law. So, so that that's part of the problem. But the the question here that you know Dwight is asking is about, um, or a statement he's making is, is the movement. So can I could you could you put it like instead this. of, I'm sorry, could you yeah. could you say that that instead of use a typical, could you say like it would be a type of what is to come? Well, that's what typical means. Okay. It's just one word for type. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. I did yeah, yeah. forgive my um, ignorance. Okay. That's okay. Typical just has the word type in it. It's just uh, another form of the word type. Okay, no so problem. it'd be the type of the Sunday law, right? Right. So we have the type of the Sunday law with the pandemic. We have yeah. all of the history dealing with Trump. We just thought because we misunderstood which line we were on. We thought then that this was talking about the actual Sunday law in the United States. Now, people are trying to make it about that, that Trump has to bring in the actual Sunday law. But that would be inconsistent with our understanding of prophecy. Because now t Trump would have to typify or be a type of himself. And there would be no precedent for that. Well, it would be like it'd be like following the multitude to do evil, wouldn't it? Well, in a sense, I mean, that's what I see is that we're we're following the popular uh, view of things. Well, that's the way I look at it, because it, to me, that's what what I think about it is it is following the multitude to do evil, because you got the whole the whole United States not saying that Trump is going to be in the White House. Mm hmm. And, and, and this, yeah, yeah go, go ahead. And this is this is Adventism. Adventism has continually followed the multitude to do evil. That is, they have they have been swayed by the opinion of the mob. Correct. Agree. Yeah, I agree. So, so his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Right. And, and we don't think we're doing right, that we're sticking to God's word. But the thing is, we haven't even understood what God's word has said. And any opposition, you know, is, is pushed aside. Nobody's even willing to examine 
I shouldn't say nobody, but within this movement, very few people are willing to examine any of the reasons, right? Why why Trump is not going to be president? True. They don't they don't want to hear those reasons. They want to believe that Trump's going to be president again. I, I feel I feel that it's going to happen. I feel this. I feel that is all I keep hearing. Yeah. Yeah. We had a five hour study where one of the members. Um, and it's on my YouTube page, who believes that Trump's going to be president again, continually attacked me personally, but also our position. Um, and and but was not willing to even consider any of our position right because they didn't actually address anything we were saying they addressed distortions of and mostly it was just attacking the man it wasn't even you know that would wasn't even about what was being said we didn't we didn't go through patiently and look at things it was it was an attack it's always a personal issue. It's, it's hardly never a, um, an actual issue. It's always something personal. Yeah, and, and nobody could ever accuse me of attacking Colin personally. In any of my discussions I've ever had with him, he would never say that I've attacked him personally. Oh, wasn't Moses a killer? A killer? You know, I mean, um, there's not a lot of good things that come out of bad people. Yeah, I, I don't know what you're talking when about. They've been called you mean when he, yeah, when they've he killed the Egyptian? So when, he killed, so when he killed the Egyptian, you're talking about? That's I'm what sorry, what? When he killed the Egyptian? Yeah. Okay, so people said, are you going to lead us because you killed the Egyptian? That sort of thing, is that what you're referring to? Okay. Right. I right. Mean, but he, he was, he was considered of, a killer. Yeah, instead of looking at the evidence, instead of examining things you find fault with a person whether it's based on reality or not that's right yeah that's right that's that that happens all the time every single day mm -hmm. to a multitude of people yeah so um yeah so this is i mean i think it's when we're trying to look at the, what the spirit of balaam is it's it's a self justification. Exactly. Um, yeah. For um, his actions, for for his greed, for his attitude, for his character, while in a pretense uh, doing something that is for God. Right. I mean, he's he's very particular. He's going to prophesy what God asked him to prophesy. Right. But ain't that ain't that a little bit in all of us? I mean, I I recognize this morning I read that chapter on Balaam in um, Patriarchs and Prophets, and I look at that and I said, well, he they he she could be talking about me. Exactly. No, if this is human nature. Yeah. This isn't this isn't you know other people I, are just like this and I'm not like this. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good. Yeah. And, and why do I know that? Because I can see it. Because yeah. the Holy Spirit has revealed it to me. The thing that's interesting, going back to Romans 7 from our study on, on Friday night, is um, when I look at Romans 7 and what Paul says about his nature, this is something that is revealed through the Holy Spirit. It can only be seen when a person has clear sight, when a person has justified themselves, they will never say, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. The will is present with me, but that which I want to perform, I find not, or whatever he says exactly his words. But um, when we see that we are like Balaam, only then can we not be like Balaam? I agree. And, and people will deny. They'll say, I'm rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. So yes. the only one who is, has the Holy Spirit working upon him is the one who recognizes he's um, um, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's the work of the Holy Spirit.
to see your spiritual condition. To justify yourself doesn't take any spiritual insight. It actually takes spiritual blindness. It reminds me of Saul in uh, 1 Samuel 15, where he says, I have performed the commandment of the Lord, and as Samuel exposed him, that he had not performed the, the commandment of the Lord fully, and Samuel had to do the dirty work for him. Yeah, and we can see um, with the, in the upper room experience, the disciples, they have to come to a recognition that they have sinned. If you're justifying yourself, you can never be reconciled to God, which is what is needful to be reconciled to your brother. Okay. And, and this, this movement needs an upper room experience. And, and that means that we need to see our true spiritual condition. Being the spiritual condition of others isn't going to help us. So if, if we're going to put this in the simplest form, do we need the Calzone vision? Do we need the Mare vision? Or do we need the Mara? Well, we need all three because you can't have the Mara without the first two. Agreed. But what, what does the Mara vision do for us that the other two are not doing? It humbles us. It humbles us to the dust. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. When we are willing to accept the Mara, the looking glass vision, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we are comparing ourselves in this looking glass vision with Christ, we begin to see pointedly our faults the things that we really don't want to have to look at now Balaam here was believing that he was going to be able to convince God to do what Balaam wanted but he's being shown the, the peculiar favor which God has regarded Israel and their distinctive character as his chosen people. When I read that, I look that Balaam is being shown his character against Israel's character. When we have to compare the two, when we have to compare ours our character with Christ. The vision is not a pretty one. Balaam saw that the position to be maintained by the Israelites, a complete separation from all surrounding nations, represented the relation which all true Christians should sustain to the world. The conversation that we have just been having, how are we going to show our separation from the world when we are buying into what the world seems to think is going to happen? Are we not then joining with the world rather than being separate from it. If we are going to stand here and say, Mr. Trump is going to be reelected, Mr. Trump is then going to take control again of the United States. The people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. At the time these words were spoken, the Israelites had no permanent settlement, and their peculiar character, their manners and customs were not familiar to Balaam. Do we at this time have a permanent settlement? 
are we in our forever home? No. no. How much more like the children of Israel are we then today? <clears throat> Yet how strikingly was this prophecy fulfilled in the after history of this people? The premise of this, of this entire portion of the study as we are going to be led back into the book of Judges is we are looking at what was happening with the children of Israel before they came into the promised land. Their first actions in the promised land was the taking of Jericho. as we prepare to be able to leave this world for the heavenly promised land, we will have to learn to leave behind Jericho. Uh, but, I, yeah, sorry. Go um, ahead. Um, so just comparing this to Jericho. So what's the, what's the parallel with these prophecies or oracles or parables of Balaam with what happens in Jericho. What I was trying to get at was that we have, as, as we're looking at this with Balaam, as we are going to see as we complete our studies in this in numbers, mm -hmm. the children of Israel did not know that there were those that sought their demise. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're not aware of what Balaam is doing. They're not aware of what Balaam is doing. They're not aware of what Balak is doing either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they will soon be aware because there will be a recommendation made since they cannot curse Israel through sophistry, they are going to then employ <clears throat> guile in order to create a division in Israel between Israel and the God of Israel. Because as long as Israel remains loyal to God and to his law, Balaam and Balak have no effect on them, right? But the moment that they turn from God, they find that God is indeed jealous because he is no longer being worshipped. Is that not what we're going to be seeing in, in the balance of this example? Yeah, pretty much. Now, I asked a question specific, for a specific reason. So, Go ahead. So that Jericho is the seven times, correct? Jericho is definitely the seven times. And so they're going to go around the city for seven days. And then on the seventh day, they're going to go around the city seven times. Right. We have this the symbol of the seven and the seven times. And in the story of Balaam, how many parables does he give? Does he not give four? There's seven. Okay. So on the last one, which which... The heading says his final oracle. He's going to take up his parable uh, four times. Right? So it says in verse 15, he took up his parable. Right? And that's right. going to be uh, the one where he says, the man whose eyes are opened has said. Um, and then he's going to, uh, let me see here. 
and and then he in verse 20 when he looked on Amalek he took up his parable and in verse 21 and he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and then in verse 23 uh, he says and he took up his parable and said alas so he's going to prophesy about Asher so there's going to be four times that he takes up his parable and and he's going to prophesy against these other nations Amalek the Kenite and uh, the Assyrians Asher well he's going to talk about uh, or specifically the Kenite shall be wasted until Asher shall carry them away um, and then he gives this and he took up his parable and says alas who shall live when God doeth this and then he's going to give up this and the ships of shall come from the coast of Kittim and shall afflict Asher right so the fourth one is about the ships of Kittim and the Assyrians at least in this symbolic parable so so there are seven altogether correct if there's four in the final one okay <clears throat> and if we liken this to the three angels messages we can see that the fourth is a repetition of the first three exactly and and this also has a fourth in it and and this is a symbol that's going to represent uh what happens uh in daniel chapter 11 and and this asher then would represent um the papacy it's going to represent what's going to happen at the end of the world with the destruction of the papacy at least that's how i understand it i haven't gone through this parable and these parables but so the final oracle has four parables in it he has four segments to it okay i got it and and four different groups so that that's altogether seven okay so, so, we have, so we have the seven altars, which I believe occurs three times, and then the final oracle, which is divided into four sections. When I've looked at this in the past, as the children of Israel came into the promised land, Jericho had to be destroyed. Right? Mm-hmm. Chiastically, as the children of God are preparing to leave for the heavenly promised land, Jericho is going to have to be abandoned. They're going to have to turn their backs on Jericho. Yet there's going to be an issue because there are going to be situations like what we're going to face as we look in Numbers 25 with the destruction that came upon the children of Israel because they, they found there were those among them that were willing to accept what the world would have considered to be normal. Now, that's just an opinion, and I'm more than willing to be shown that I'm wrong. Now, in this situation, Balaam beheld the vast multitude of holy happy ones rejoicing in the unfading glories of the earth made new. Gazing upon the scene, the prophet exclaimed, who can count the dust of the righteous or the number of the fourth part of Israel? As he sees the crowns of glory on every brow, the joy beaming from every countenance and looks toward to that endless life of unalloyed felicity, he utters the solemn prayer, let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. What a testimony is this, born before king and princes. The light of heaven has been permitted to shine upon the prophet's mind, revealing to him the purposes of God toward his people. 
if Balaam has a disposition to accept the light which God has given, he will now make true his words. He will sever at once and forever all connection with Moab. Balaam is shown clearly, unobstructedly, without any cloud to his spiritual vision great light. Does he accept and honor the light that was given him? Does he make use of that light? It doesn't appear that way. <clears throat> Mrs. White continued. He will no longer presume upon the mercy of God, but will return to God with deep repentance and humiliation. What are the next six words? But De Balaam did no such thing. Balaam refused to repent. Balaam refused to humble himself. May this not be said about us. Amen. He loved the wages of unrighteousness, and this he was determined to secure at any cost. When we are walking in the same path that the world sets before us, when we are in more in agreement with the world than we are with God, we are showing that we love the wages of unrighteousness and we want to be vindicated and are determined to secure that vindication at any cost. Now, I'm going to be very blunt. This is not Theodore saying this. This is me saying it. I am reading this from what Mrs. White has written, but my application is mine and mine alone. When we are choosing to say that we are in agreement with what the world is seeing, we have a problem. When we are saying, time will tell, we have a problem. We are not placing our faith in God, we are placing our faith in man. Now that is my comment. And Balak said unto Balaam, what hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. Balaam could not make use of the light that God had given. Balak refused the light that was presented before him. Balaam answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? But did Balaam like what the Lord had put in his mouth? No. Did he accept what the Lord had put into his mouth? Evidently not. Now, as Theodore was saying, here we have again a second parable and Balak said unto him come I pray thee 
with me unto another place from whence thou mayest see of them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them and shall not see them at all and curse me them from thence. And he brought him unto the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. So he's brought to another place on the top of a hill. He then said unto Balak, stand here by thy burnt offering while I meet the Lord yonder. Balak had confidently expected a curse that would fall like a withering blight upon Israel. And the words of the prophet filled him with surprise and with horror. He passionately exclaimed, what hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them all together. There are those that confidently expect the re-election of Donald John Trump. There are those that expect that Mr. Trump is again going to control the United States. We are to look not to the power of man and not to be in agreement with the world, but to let God lead us. Balaam endeavored to make virtue of necessity and professed to have spoken from a conscientious regard for the will of God, the words which had been forced from his lips by divine power. His answer, spoken truly, but disingenuously, must I not heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? Balak could not even now relinquish his hope of securing the destruction of Israel. He decided that the imposing spectacle presented by the vast encampment of the Hebrews, arranged in perfect order, each tribe with its own standard and the tabernacle of God among them had so intimidated Balaam that he dare not practice his divinations against them. So you have in the daylight all of the tribes arranged in perfect order. You have the tabernacle in the midst of them. comment from some of the things that I listened to yesterday. What is the central pillar of the Advent faith? Ellen White says that the central pillar and foundation, so she talks about the pillar and the foundation, is the 2300 days in the connection with the sanctuary. How many pillars were in the sanctuary? Well, I'm guessing there. Okay. I'm going to guess too. I'm going to say seven. I'm, I'm going to go according to what I heard in this study, and I'm going, I'm going to be looking at this for my own edification, because I think they may be very correct, but I think we would find that there are 69 pillars. So talking about the pillars that... Um... That hold up the curtains that surround the... Correct. Sanctuary... Sanctuary itself. Okay. Yeah, that's what, yeah. Now, 
given that this was daylight, if you're looking upon the sanctuary from a, a promontory, and you have all of the banners and the encampments around that sanctuary, what else can you see? Well, you should be able to see the, uh, the, the, uh, the big laver that they used uh, in the middle of it, you know, out in the, in the courtyard there. You should be able to see the um, smoke coming up out of the out of the tent of meetings. Um, there's lots of things that they should be able to see in this view. How were the children of Israel being led? By God. Well, pillar of cloud by day. By the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke at night. I mean, it, yeah, and day. And pillar of fire at night. So the pillar of cloud would have been visible during the day. Oh, yeah. Balak and Balaam would have looked upon this and seen the pillar of cloud, right? Oh, yeah. So if you have 69 pillars in the sanctuary, would not that pillar of cloud or of fire have been the 70th pillar? <laughs> I see where you're going with this. <laughs> yes. 70th. Oh, man. That's seven times 10. Seven times. Seven times. Yeah. <laughs> So this pillar of cloud would have been visible. This pillar of cloud would have been front and center, prominently before them. I would say so. That's what he did was he led in front of them, right? Correct. And then came to behind him when the Egyptians attacked. Right. So it would definitely be prominent. So it would be Glorious something, sight. it would be something that they could not ignore. Oh yeah. But it's easy for us to forget that. I mean, because it just took me to it took you to remind me that that pillar was actually there. Well, when we're looking at these things, I mean, I, I was going back over an old study a study from easily 10 years ago to be reminded of so many of these things. And this, this study had nothing to do with the study of Balaam. <laughs> but when we start to consider this, here are the pillars in this sanctuary. Here is how the children of Israel were being led. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night was all priced. Balaam was seeking of God to curse Israel when the blessing and the power of Israel was right before him. Mm. The king Balak had hoped that a change of place might affect something in his favor. <clears throat> He would take the prophet to a small point where only a small part of the host of Israel might be seen. And if he could there get Balaam to curse them in detached parties, the whole camp might soon be devoted to destruction. 
in all of this, Balak seems to still have had perfect confidence that Balaam's enchantments could paralyze the strength of Israel and bring confusion and defeat upon their enemies. Seeing just a small portion of the encampment of Israel made no difference. Yet the king thought it would. Balaam wanted to believe that God was going to change his mind with the additional sacrifices to be offered. Trying to make a deal with God again. Exactly. It don't work that way. I've tried. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> You're not the only one that's tried. Trust <laughs> me. Trust me on that, brother. Now, here again, we are being shown the three angels' message. The message of righteousness by faith. But we are being shown this. How we shouldn't attempt to approach the message. When we walk according to the sanctuary where we look that we must fear God, give glory to him, and accept that the hour of his judgment has come. We will find that our prosecutor is not only our defense attorney, but is also our judge. But we need to walk by faith. Balaam had faith in the reward that Balak offered. He coveted that reward. We cannot afford to be coveting anything. We need to humble ourselves so that the glory of man is truly laid in the dust. And that is what Balaam refused to do. Now we are coming close to the end of our time together today. Are there any other comments or questions? Yes, yes, I got a, I got a question. Go ahead. So um, I'm sitting here looking I spent the like first 10 minutes of 10, 15 minutes um, trying to find that uh, that reference that you're using. And um, I can't seem to, I did word searches on it and I couldn't seem to pull it out of her writings. Uh, the uh, December 2nd, 1880, Signs of the Times, it looks like. Right, we, we've gone through December 2nd and December 9th, yes. So where did you get those? How did you copy those references? Uh, I was I was actually just using Balaam as my keyword. If you would like, I can I can have all this copied in the source materials and then sent over to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. I, 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 I don't even see the article in the Signs of the Times yet. I'm still kind of panning over it. Yeah, what, what, what I've learned I have to do when I'm online is I have to sort this so that the earliest articles come up first. Okay. And once I've done that, then it comes 
in somewhat chronological order. And how do you do the how do you do the sort? Um, what I you're talking about at the E.G. White uh, site, right? E.G. White writings, yes. When I'm okay. when I'm looking through this, when I go to the initial window, there's normally a a window uh, or a small drop down to the right that asks how I wish this to be sorted, and I go earliest first. Okay, I, I don't find it. Okay, I'm having troubles locating I'll, it. I'll see if I'll, I'll see if there's an easier way I have of explaining this, and then I'll I'll get this presented so it can uh, maybe you can off. take a screenshot of uh, with your cursor on the where it is that you're. Um, okay, I'll do clicking what I on to right. Understood. That would be nice. I'd appreciate that. Okay. Brother Dwight. Yes. I got a um I was in a conversation with Collins several, uh, I think it's a month or so ago. I didn't forget when it was. But you keep on bringing up that that phrase, uh, time will tell. Right. Well, me and him was discussing that, discussing the president and all that. And I I'm the one who said that. Time will tell. And I want you to, when it just, I wanted you to let you know that, that who said that it was me. Well, I, I've also had several of the presentations when Colin has been asked questions where he has come out saying, time will tell. Yeah, this was months ago. Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted is, to, I just want to let you know I did because I was in, I was, I was about tired of talking about Donald Trump. So, in my haste, I said, time will tell. Yeah. Okay. I believe God is yeah. using all of us, not just one or two of us. Yeah, that God is what, sister? Yeah. I miss God that. is using all of us, not mm -hmm. just one or two of us. That's mm -hmm. right. No, this, that, yeah, this movement has to become united, so... Um, I have you... something to um, um, tell it when when we're done here. Okay. Okay. Well, well can I say something? Uh, I want to. I want to apologize, and that's what it, um, for that. So. Okay. Well, how about we close this study, and then, uh, and then. We can talk about this after the study is ended. Okay. Thank you. All right. Loving Father in heaven, I thank you for the open conversation that we've had today. I thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you are providing as we are looking over the example of Balaam, of Balak, and what it means for your children today. Please guide us through this day. May your character become evident in all that is said and done. Help us so that we may more perfectly represent you with all with whom we come in contact through this day. Direct us now. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.